Native people, Native culture, Native knowledge. Hi, I'm Jeannie Green, bringing you award-winning Heartbeat Alaska. Bringing you national and international Native news, this is award-winning Heartbeat Alaska, the premier Native voice in Native programming. There's a heartbeat loud as thunder Revolution is in the air There's a heartbeat deep inside our mother Are you too cool to care? With Heartbeat Alaska, here's Jeannie Green. Hello, welcome to Heartbeat Alaska, Native news and Native entertainment from a Native perspective. I'm Jeannie Green. On today's program, we travel through rural Alaska. Village public safety officers are responsible for safety in many of the villages in Alaska. We also travel to Texas, to Livingston, Texas, compliments of Raymond Garcia. Raymond lives in Houston, Texas, and sent us that video. Heartbeat Alaska will be aired in Houston, by the way, in September. We have Native American music videos and more trips to villages. Here's Gary Five First with Native news across the nation. And I'll be back in just a moment, so don't go away. Competition dancers, girls in jingle dresses, reminds me of the good old days. Take me back in time. Down to the crow fair Indian revival Cultural survival Hanging on to Indian ways It's good to be Down at the crow fair This is Native News Across the Nation. I'm Gary Fife. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has raised objections over a Kansas plan to build some new highways. They say it would take away part of the Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence. The EPA says the designs for traffic bypasses would infringe on native religious practices of both students and the local community. A sweat lodge and medicine wheel would have been disturbed and a wetlands cut in half. An agreement has been reached in an Oklahoma battle over taxation of gasoline sold by tribally owned enterprises. According to Oklahoma Governor Frank Keating, tribes will be able to sell gas under a contract with the state and get a tax break. The collection of the state motor fuel tax will be shifted to the refinery and tribes, tribal operators will have to pass on that cost to consumers. The American banking industry should be paying more attention to doing business with Native Americans. That's the word from U.S. Attorney General Janet Reno. She made her remarks in a recent speech to American bankers at the Consumer Credit Conference in Boston, Massachusetts. Reno said that the Justice Department had alleged that some banks had charged interest rates higher for Natives than for other customers, and that some banks had refused to make loans to Natives whose collateral lay within reservation borders. The, uh, the Attorney General also acknowledged some banks who had achieved positive results. The Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma will be talking with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers about economic development along the Arkansas River in northeast Oklahoma. The tribe is exploring possibilities of using its ownership of the Arkansas River bed to consider several economic projects. Among those would be a lucrative riverboat gambling business building a retirement village or going into the import-export business on an international basis. And finally, the Yankton Sioux Business and Claims Committee has publicly declared that it did not have anything to do with the recent gathering of UFO believers and a private Sundance ceremony held on their South Dakota reservation. The Star Knowledge Conference and Sundance was a gathering of individuals who believe in extraterrestrial life and visitations to Earth. One of the organizers, who is a tribal member, said he would also reveal Native spiritual secrets and practices to non-Natives. That drew a response from the Yankton Committee, who said they would not endorse any actions where non-Natives would participate in their sacred Sundance. 
And if you have news or information about your tribe, your native group, or an event coming up, please share it with us, give us a call, or drop us a line. This is Native News Across the Nation. For Heartbeat Alaska, I'm Gary Fife, and back to Jeannie and more of our program. Thanks, Gary. We travel now to Arizona, where tradition and heritage are now part of the regular school curriculum. They gathered at the Navajo Education Center in Window Rock, Arizona. A booklet was unveiled that just may change the face of Navajo education. Hailed as an educational milestone, the booklet contains the Diné culture and language. This is a first for the Navajo Nation. The first time teaching methods based on Navajo medicines, artists, and traditional knowledge will be part of every Navajo child's school day. Jared, who? The booklet was compiled out of a need to find ways and means for the survival of the language and the culture. A survival tied directly to their past. In the name of manifest destiny, settlers and soldiers invaded Indian land throughout the 1800s. Treaties were signed and broken. For 40 years, Navajos fought a war to defend their land. Defeated, they were forced to leave and make a 300-mile march known as the Long Walk to Fort Sumner. Their confinement was a bitter one, and they suffered from hunger and disease. After three years of inhuman conditions, they signed the Treaty of 1868, which returned them to their land. Prior to the creation of this booklet, most schools did not have Diné cultural and language programs. In 1984, the Navajo Nation Council mandated the adoption of Navajo language and culture by all schools serving Navajo children. The Navajo Nation numbers 250,000. Many speak their native tongue. Albert Hale, president of the Navajo Nation, strongly encouraged all Navajos to speak their native language and to participate in the cultural activities that will perpetuate and maintain the Diné language and culture forever. If you were to travel to rural Alaska, chances are you'd meet someone in uniform. It wouldn't be a policeman or an emergency medical technician or a fireman. It'd be a village public safety officer. All three of those wrapped up in one uniform. Their motto is first responders, last frontier. Village public safety officers are generally the first to respond to calls for help from community members in the bush. Bush conditions in Alaska are nothing like the city. The same goes for law enforcement and safety. What works in the city often does not apply in the bush. Class, dress right, dress. Wait on the command. At close interval, dress right, dress. The Alaska Department of Public Wait. Safety recognized these differences, and in the late 1970s, a wider range of public safety services was born, the Village Public Safety Officers Program. The VPSOs are dedicated and concerned citizens willing to undergo training at Sitka at the Alaska State Trooper Academy. The VPSO Training Academy in Sitka is tailor-made for the bush. The officers are trained in five public safety areas, 
fire suppression, law enforcement, search and rescue, water safety, and emergency medical services. This type of training provides the VPSO with the rudimentary tools, tools required to handle most incidents, incidents that are serious threats to life and property in the bush. After training, the VPSO officers go home. Often home is where they grew up, a village peopled with relatives and friends. It's a unique situation. It can be a tough job, also a rewarding one. Public safety, protecting those you know as neighbors. But it may also mean protecting neighbors from other neighbors. This is where dedication and caring play a major role. I know I'll feel a lot more confident doing my job because there was a lot of things that I didn't understand um, when dealing with, you know, just dealing with like domestic violence and stuff like that. Now I have a better understanding and I'd, I'd feel more comfortable handling those situations. Continual support from the Alaska State Troopers makes handling situations much easier. Each VPSO is assigned to an oversight trooper that serves as a mentor. The oversight troopers assist on a day-to-day -day basis, providing each VPSO with a wide spectrum of on-the-job training and conducting oversight visits to the villages. Law enforcement in most rural areas is the responsibility of the Alaska State Troopers. From bush outposts, troopers attempt to respond immediately to emergencies, as quickly as possible to felony cases, and as soon as possible to misdemeanors. Their efforts, however, are often hampered by delayed notification, long response distance, uncertainties of weather and transportation, and limited manpower. In communities associated with the VPSO program, citizens are afforded immediate response to all emergencies without delays, delays caused by weather and distance, or budgetary restraints. And although VPSOs are not expected to handle high-risk or complex investigative situations, they do act as a valuable communications link with the troopers. Helping others and sharing was once a way of life in rural Alaska. Today, natives in the bush still respond to a neighbor's need. Sometimes that means enforcing waterway laws, like wearing life preservers and jackets. The VPSO lives in the bush. He's the one in the uniform. He's probably your neighbor, a good one to have. Support our communities, defend our freedoms, and preserve our way of life. It's Americans committed to the ideal of the citizen soldier. You'll find them in your neighborhood, teaching children, running businesses, raising families. They're people like you and me, dedicated, capable, honest, proud, and they will always be here, serving the communities they're a part of, just as the Army National Guard has been doing for over 350 years. The Army National Guard, Americans at their best. I'm Jenny Green. Join me and Gary Fife for Heartbeat Alaska. We travel now to Greenland for part three of Greenland Land of Challenge. Uh, 
Since 1800, a variety of minerals has been exploited. Cryolite, copper, coal, and zinc have been the objects of mining interest over the years. It's common knowledge that Greenland possesses many mineral and energy resources, and the search for them has intensified over recent years. Off Greenland's west coast lie the island of Disco and the Nushuak Peninsula. They are the result of volcanic activity, which also produced oil and coal deposits here 65 million years ago. The Greenlandic Home Rule government has the overall responsibility for the safeguarding of the Greenlandic environment. It is well known that the Arctic environment is extremely fragile and particularly vulnerable to pollution. The Greenlandic government, therefore, is working on the establishment of uniform regulations governing the oil industry in the Arctic regions. Stringent demands will undoubtedly be made on the oil companies in the event of future oil extractions. The regions round about the drilling places have been important hunting and fishing territories since the very old days. Ummenakfjord consists of seven settlements and the main town of Ummenak. Most of its 2,500 inhabitants live from hunting and fishing. The settlement of Itloshuit has 125 inhabitants. For six months of the year, the sea surrounding it is completely frozen over. In the hunting districts of Upelnavik and Ummennach, the hunters are now readapting themselves to the lives of fishermen. At the same time, catches of Greenland halibut have been increasing over the past two years or so. In winter, the halibut are fished for through holes in the ice with nets or long lines. It's a delicious spring day, and Elmni and Pavia are off hunting and fishing. The air is warm, but the ice is still cold and firm. In spring, thousands of seals take sun baths on the ice. Seal meat is very important to Greenlandic families, and seal skin is either used by the hunters themselves or sold for processing. We're now north of the Arctic Circle, where in the spring, the sun does not set. When the sun is at its lowest point, the long line is pulled up. As the sun moves towards the horizon, the air cools and condensation takes place, creating an atmospheric mist. In the cold winter months, the temperature often falls to minus 30 degrees. Since the disappearance of cod from Greenlandic waters, halibut stocks have been increasing. At the present time, about 14,000 tons of Greenland halibut are bought and sold annually. To safeguard the stocks of halibut, the government is introducing regulations which permit only license holders to buy and sell in the future. Uh, 
Ash, men of the Karan. Greenlandic women have traditionally exerted a strong influence on Greenlandic culture, and thereby also on the survival of Inuit hunting society in the implacable Arctic environment. Over thousands of years, Greenlandic women developed the art of skin sewing, a skill imperative to survival in the extremely cold climate. They were also responsible for the production of some of the hunting tools. It is logical and natural then that the women of Greenland, in the spirit and tradition of their female ancestors, continue to exert their influence on the artistic and cultural life of Greenland. I'm gonna vote. Are you going to vote? Let's control our destiny. Let's get out and vote. Register now. You better vote. Let's travel now to Florida, to the Everglades, with Chief Jim Billy, chief of the Seminole tribe there. Jim Billy, by the way, used to wrestle alligators for a living before he became chief of the Seminole tribe. Here's Hull Putty Chobie. Big alligator, he's mysterious. Big alligator, he's amphibious. Big alligator, he's dangerous. But with a big alligator, you can be prosperous. I was raised in the swamp by my old grandpa. We ate turtle meat. A fish called Gar. Grandpa told me about panthers and bears, but most of all, he told me to beware. But Hull Putty Chubby knocked your mitts kick up. Hull Putty Chubby, okay, yeah, you won. Hull Putty Chubby, you know what you do on. Hull Putty Chubby, he marched out you on. As the days of the summers grew longer and hot, Grandpa took me on my first gator hunt. We pushed the sawgrass, willow slew, with a big yellow dog that dug out the new. The dog started sniffing something in the air. Grandpa said, must be gator over there. Better grab your knife and some rope. And remember what I told you when you was a boy. Huddle but the chewy, not your head stick on. Huddle but the chewy, oaking okay, cage he was. At the age of 12, I was sure of myself. I could catch alligators by myself. But my dog didn't know what my grandpa said. He jumped in the water by the gator's head. Hunt but the chubby didn't even pause. My dog disappeared in the gator's jaws. I can still hear my grandpa saying, Later, I remember that day how that big bull gator swallowed my dog. Scars and pain haunts my life, but I've learned to live and I learned to survive. Thank you so much for joining me for another Heartbeat Alaska. So glad to have you with us. Native people traditionally care and share for one another. In the past, it was a means of survival. 
And today, it's also a means of survival. Regardless of whether you live in the city, you're still surrounded by your brothers and sisters, and we all have a responsibility to care for one another. It's not only the elders that are wise. In a sense, we're all elders. After all, there's always someone younger than us, someone that needs guidance and caring from us. We leave you now with OCM, We Are All Family, a song dedicated to the Ismalka family in Ruby, Alaska. I'm Jeannie Green. For all of us here, God bless you. Have a fabulous week, and we'll see you again next week. Share.